since I feel pretty much among friends and fringies here, I, it doesn't trouble me to confess that my book, Food of the Gods, I really conceived of as a kind of intellectual Trojan horse. It's written as though it were a scientific study, footnotes, bibliography, citations of impossible to obtain books, and so <laughs> forth and so on. But th this is simply to assuage and calm the academic anthropologists. The idea is to leave this thing on their doorstep, rather like an abandoned baby or a Trojan horse, and they will open their doors to it and take it inside only to discover that out of this very staid rational discourse pour the self-transforming elf machines from hyperspace <laughs> with their own agenda. <clears throat> I, I feel like I should say this, it's more for my ease than yours that I reached the conclusions that I now espouse uh, through skepticism, reason, rationalism, and uh, tough argument. So it may sound ditzy, flaky, and soft-headed, uh, but that's just because you're hearing it wrong. <laughs> the, uh, the guiding input was experience and in a way what we're gathered here to talk about uh, tonight is an experience which is not only rare, transformative, challenging, but also for reasons which we'll probably get around to illegal. So uh, it's a uh, it's a very peculiar situation. Very few experiences are illegal. And our uh, models of the world are built up based on our experience. So if you make an experience illegal, you're essentially saying it is off limits for model building. You can't include that in your model because it isn't really there in some sense. And, and this is the situation in Western society vis-a-vis -vis the psychedelic experience. To my mind, the psychedelic experience is as much a part of being human as sexuality, in personal independence, uh, child rearing. These are the things which are scripted into us as opportunities for exercising our peculiar situation vis-a-vis -vis the phenomenon of being. And a society which would deny that is a society whose secret, or maybe not so secret, agenda is the infantilization of its citizens. I mean, if we are not capable of dealing with these things, then who is? And are the people who made the rules did they carefully, conscientiously, and at depth explore these dimensions and decide they were unfit for human consumption? Or uh, was it done more hastily, more mindlessly, and with more fear? I would submit to you that uh, it's the latter. Well, first of all, I want to talk about the impact of psychedelics, especially in this case psilocybin, on humanness, and then if there's time, maybe we can talk a little bit about what is so great about it. I had a philosophy professor once, Paul Feyerob, and some of you may know his books, and he opened his Epistemology 101 course by saying, I'm going to teach you what truth is, and then I'm going to teach you what's so great about it. Well, I won't claim to teach what the psychedelic experience is. That you will have to find out on your own. But I think it is legitimate to discuss what's so great about it. You know, are we, by any measurable index, superior or inferior to people who do not have this experience? Because if not, then really the psychedelic position is no more than a kind of cult 
to be lined up along with Roman Catholicism and all the other cults out there. Speaking as a former member, of course. <clears throat> well, my, uh, my notion of the way to legitimate, to legitimate the importance of psychedelics is by showing, and I think one can show uh, in fairly short order, that these things are not alien to the human experience or ancillary or the province of uneducated uh, little brown people down in the rainforest or anything like that, I submit to you that the psychedelic experience and the impact of psychedelic plants on human beings is central to understanding who we are and how we got this way. And if we can uh, explore this issue and convince ourselves that there's some merit in this point of view, then it will simply, it will do more than rewrite the annals of a staid science like anthropology. It will actually change how we relate to each other and to the planet that we're in the process of grinding into uh, pollution. So that's the raison d'etre for the politics behind it. Now, here's the spiel. Uh, sometime in the last three million years, the uh, proto, our remote ancestors, the proto-hominids, uh, were uh, disrupted in their evolutionary climax in the canopies of the great rainforests of Africa. You see, most animal species evolve into a niche tighter and tighter and tighter. We see this with termites and cockroaches and most life forms. This is what happens to them. Only if the niche is somehow disrupted or destroyed does the game veer away from its tendency toward closure. And this is what happened to us. Uh, our remote ancestors would have lived happily in the climaxed rainforests of Africa in the same way that primates to this day live happily in the climaxed rainforests of, of uh, Indonesia and uh, South America. But for the fact that the dynamics of the planet, and this ultimately is, if we're looking for a cause, or some people would say a villain, then it's the climatological dynamics of the planet which began to uh, limit these rainforest habitats. And a new kind of habitat began to form in Africa, which was grassland. It's very recent. And under nutritional pressure, and under a pressure that was the result of this retreating environment, our remote ancestors descended from the trees and began to uh, adapt themselves to the new world of the grassland. And they did this uh, over a period of probably a couple of million years. Now, I maintain, and if any of you are evolutionary biologists or anthropologists, this is the nub of my position. Here's what's new scientifically. What they teach you about evolution is that it's caused by mutation, which is a random process, which then meets another random process, which is natural selection. And out of these two random processes, lo and behold, you get sea urchins, birds of paradise, gray whales, and human beings. Now, uh, when you inquire as to what is the source of this mutation, you will be told it's cosmic rays, incident incoming hard radiation which can disrupt chromosomes, and then most of these mutations are lethal, some huge percentage of them, but a vanishingly small number of them actually confer adaptive advantage, and they are then preserved in the genome and passed on. Now, what I want to suggest, and I've never seen it thoroughly treated by, by evolutionary thinkers, is that uh, 
food is the unexamined source of evolutionary pressure. It can be. If you know anything about animal species, you know that most animals tend to specialize their diet. Uh, insects are famous for this. Uh, if you find a caterpillar and you want to raise it in a jar, you must give it the food plant you found it on because they don't just eat leaves. It doesn't work like that. They have species-specific adaptations. Now, why is this? It's because it's a strategy to limit exposure to toxic and mutagenic chemicals that other life forms are sequestering in their tissue to discourage predation, essentially. Well, so then what happens when an animal population, such as our remote ancestors, uh, comes under uh, uh, pressure from a dwindling habitat or a limited uh, uh, availability of food. Well, what happens, if you have any sense, is you start experimenting. You start digging up roots you never thought about before and chewing on them. You start eating leaves. You start eating insect protein. You experiment with the slaughter of small animals and so forth and so on. And this is precisely what our remote ancestors did. This is the much lamented transition from fruititarian holiness to predatory carnivorous messiness. Um, but had we not been willing to lower our gourmet standards, uh, we would have entered the fossil record at that point. So, so here we have these proto-hominids foraging into this new grassland environment, beginning to beat on prairie dogs and uh, stuff like that. And, and simultaneously, as we all know, evolving in this African belt environment were great herds of ungulate animals, proto-cattle, uh, bison, wildebeest, antelopes, uh, many, many different kinds of animals. And uh, one of the curiosities of nature is that many mushrooms prefer the dung of ungulate animals to just going out and making a deal with the raw natural environment. They like the leavening that goes on with vegetable material when it passes through the double stomach of an ungulate animal. Uh, as a headline, what this means is mushrooms grow in manure. And so our remote ancestors testing for insects and eating small animals would certainly have encountered the so-called coprophytic or coprophilic, the dung-loving mushrooms. And they would have tested them for food. Years ago when I was in Kenya, I observed baboon troops in this very environment we're discussing, and their habit was they were very interested in cow pies because they had learned from experience that if you rush over to a, uh, a uh, relatively old cow pie and flip it over, there's a high probability of beetles or beetle grubs uh, under there, and so these were vectors for food getting. Well, in the Am I did not observe mushrooms in Africa, but I observed mushrooms in the Amazon, and they can attain the size of a, of a dinner plate. I've never seen them in cultivation quite that large. But, you know, you come out after a hard rain and these things are landed like little flying saucers or frisbees in, uh, in the uh, meadows. They would certainly have been tested for their uh, uh, nutritional potential. And psilocybin, different from all other chemicals in nature, including, as far as I can tell, all other hallucinogenic chemicals in nature, psilocybin has a unique set of characteristics which implicate it, to my mind, very strongly in the catalyzing of the emergence of humanness out of proto-hominid and hominid organization. And it works like this. It's very 
relatively easy to understand as major scientific breakthroughs go. At least you're not going to be asked to do any partial differential equations uh, this evening. Psilocybin in very low doses, doses so low that if you were to take a dose this low, you could conceivably forget you had done it and just go out and shop and fiddle around. But at doses so low that they do not register as a psychedelic experience, psilocybin imparts measurable improvement in visual acuity. Roland Fisher did this work in the late 50s and early 60s, and they, had, they built an experimental device where a person who could not be seen by turning a crank there were two parallel bars, and by turning a crank, this person could rotate one of the parallel bars so that uh, it was no longer parallel. And uh, lacking talking rats, they went to the next preferred experimental animal, which is graduate students, and they would sit a graduate student down in front of this device, give them a very low dose of psilocybin, and then put a buzzer in their hand and say, when the two bars are no longer parallel, push the buzzer. And uh, Fisher collected large amounts of data which showed that the people who had taken the psilocybin, and the other people were given placebo, of course, could detect this deformation long before the unstoned subjects were able to do so. And Fisher, who was a totally straight European scientist, in fact, a Vienneser, when I talked to him about this stuff, he was very cagey, and he said, he was funny, in fact. He said, well, you see, uh, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, apparently, here we have data which uh, argues significantly that we are perceiving reality better with the drug than without the drug. <laughs> yes. Yes. <clears throat> For him, that was a joke. I mean, he never did anything with it. It was just a throwaway line. But it stuck with me. And I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to see that if you are a hunting animal in a situation of nutritional pressure, as our remote ancestors were, and there is a food in that environment which will give you better vision, then by God, the animals which accept that item into their diet are going to be more successful hunters than the ones that do not. And consequently, they will outbreed those members of the population that have some aversion to this exotic food. Either they don't like the look of it, or they don't like that it grows in manure, and they don't like the taste of it. But those who accept it as a dietary item will be more successful at getting food and consequently more successful at raising their offspring to sexual maturity. And that's the name of the game in Darwinian evolution. You must raise your offspring to sexual maturity. Then the genes flow forward. If you fail in that, you get an F in the, in the evolution game. Well, okay, so visual acuity, that's all very fine. Uh, but psilocybin has other properties which build on that initial pharmacological peculiarity.